Good afternoon, good evening, depending on uh, where you are. This is uh, one more of um, the uh, webinars that um, um, the um, that torch the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities and a special network we have um, um, created within Torch, a network rethinking modern Greek studies in the 21st century, uh, a cultural analysis network that operates um, for the moment between the universities of Oxford and Amsterdam and intends to grow and keep growing. Um, so, Welcome to one more of the webinars that uh, Torch and Modern Greek Studies in Torch are putting together. Um, we have, uh, since the beginning of this academic year, been calling colleagues to uh, contribute to debates that are both local, related somehow to Greece, but also global, opening up to further ideas. Um, thank you to Ambara Khalidi from Torch, who is helping us um, with everything um, that uh, relates to the organization of these events. And of course, to um, my colleagues, uh, Christina Gergau Daite, um, who, um, um, and Maria Boletzi from the University of Amsterdam, um, who are um, um, the, the core of uh, this network. Today's event. Uh, relates to something that is uh, in uh, all our minds and uh, all our discussions. And uh, perhaps the title uh, has uh, made you expecting also a kind of different take on it. COVID-19, uh, COVID our intense biopolitical present and before. COVID and before. I will explain in a minute what we mean by that. But let me start with a story. On the 29th of December 2020, Michalis Chrysokoidis, the Minister for Public Order in Greece, or the Minister for the Protection of the Citizens, as this role is called in Greece in recent years, paid to the country's northeastern border in Evros to inspect the fortified structure currently being erected there. From that location, he announced the following. He said, quote, 2020 was the year during which we were really tested, both here at the border and in the ventilators. But 2021 will be the year of security, the year of the vaccine and of the fortified fence. The year of the vaccine and of the fortified, fortified fence, I repeat. We will win over the coronavirus and we will be safe as Greek men and women. We will be safe as Europeans." End of quote. One does not need, of course, more phrases like this to realize how much the current global health emergency has intensified the power of central governments over life and over our life as individuals, as groups, as nations. We're all tested in the ventilators, the politician says, even at the very moment when he inspects the very structure that will keep others, those migrant and refugees, for instance, want to go through the border, out. Out of the country, out of Europe, out of the citizenry which he is supposed to serve and guard as a minister, and of course, out of our ventilators. At the same time, one does not really need more of such phrases in order to realize how this power over life, how this biopolitics is related not only to health, but to so many other aspects of our life, to discourses of security, of identity, of belonging, to various states of emergency and moral panics, to various fences, proliferating fences, outside, inside, and in the gray areas of the in-between. Those of us who have been close to the country of Greece, especially in the last decade with the onslaught of what has been called the Greek crisis, know of course these entanglements quite well. As most of us in this panel today have asserted uh, at various points, we have been living in an intense biopolitical present in Greece for some years now. And of course, this did not happen 
only in Greece. And this did not happen only during the recent socioeconomic crisis. But Greece did indeed become a spectacular example for more than a decade now of how a population is steered as a group with everyday decisions over life. Macro decisions, memoranda, salary and pension cuts, huge underfunding of public services, a relative loss of national sovereignty, but also micro decisions, decisions on everyone's life, impact on people's psychological health, the visible effects on the politics of austerity on the streets and the walls of the cities or the contact or, and conduct of each and every one. In Greece, we have been living for some time now in an intense biopolitical present and quite spectacularly so. I'm not sure whether this gives us any special insight for the contemporary COVID biopolitical moment and that global moment, but at least tonight we have assembled a panel to inquire about that too, to see the connections and to see what the local case can how the local case can talk to that global debate. This was the central idea based on which we put today's event together. One more in the series of local cases, global debates of our network. And we wanted to start from this current moment, the intense biopolitical present of COVID-19, but also to go back and to reflect what the current situation can teach us about the past, as well as how the present, how the recent past, sorry, can talk to the present. We invited, therefore, a panel of scholars from different disciplines in the humanities and social sciences and asked them to share their insight of this past and present biopolitics. We wanted COVID-19 uh, to be brought back into the larger context, a larger context of analysis that we hope will uh, include in today's discussion also neoliberal population management at large, new social agendas, neo nationalism and neo fascism, moral panics and new borders, racism, homo and transphobia, gender violence, bio industry, bio citizenship, archaeopolitics, and the new past. Are they all related? Can we still be talking about these things during our COVID emergency? These are some of the major questions that we shared with our panelists and we invited them to talk about. Without further ado, I want to start uh, with our first speaker who was also um, 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 one of the people, one a central um, person who helped with the organization of this event, Professor Dimitris Plandros from the University uh, of Athens. Uh, Dimitris Plandros uh, is an archeologist uh, by training and um, as a tutor, um, but he's also uh, a man of uh, many, many, many uh, trades, uh, I must say. He is a very influential public scholar and public um, <clears throat> writer in Greece, uh, talking among other things about the ways in which the classical past is being used and these are his own words, is being used as an archaeopolitics that becomes more and more an, a biopolitics uh, in contemporary Greece. Um, and uh, it is from that, I suppose, I think uh, that from what I see from his title, that he will start today's discussion. Dimitri. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as most of our listeners must be aware by now, the year 2021 sees the bicentenary of the so-called Greek Revolution, also known in Greek as Toikosiena, the 21, that is the beginning of the War of Independence against the Ottoman Empire, traditionally thought to have been declared on March 25th, 1881, a revolt that eventually led to the emergence of the modern Greek nation state in 1830. Um, Greece. Greece was planning to celebrate um, this significant landmark in its history um, and a national committee fittingly and rather unexcitingly titled Greece 2021 
was created soon after the general election of 2019, when the Conservatives returned to power in order to represent 2021, uh, in their words, as a window of opportunity uh, for the future of Greece. Uh, the committee is led by none other than Yana Angelopoulos Daskalaki, who also famously led the committee for the 2004 Olympics with rather dubious results, if the Gargantuan budget deficit of that endeavor is anything to go by. It would be interesting, though, I think, to observe how the official bicentenary celebrations have chosen to represent the Greek nation to itself and others through, thus far, some performative attempts and mostly casual rhetoric. Uh, the unfortunate outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic has dampened down the national effort to a significant extent. Conferences and exhibitions have already been postponed to a more appropriate post-vaccine future moment, whereas uh, what is produced bears the strong marks of a pandemic biopolitics, social distancing, masks, quarantine as a way of life. Think, for example, uh, the by now uh, mostly forgotten publicity stunt produced by the 2021 committee, uh, advertised as um, the celebrations video clip uh, and officially labeled May the Dancers Never Stop uh, from the well-known Dionysia Savopoulos song used in it. Um, if anyone in the audience remains oblivious of this 1983 Greek hit, let them be assured that there is no need to ever look it up now. Um, with its bluntly nationalist candor, its blatant historical anachronisms, its exuberant yet sadly outmoded exceptionalism, and its ever so thinly disguised, disguised uh, xenophobia, this song, like its maker, has long passed its sell-by date. Rather than introducing a new window of opportunity to imagine, imagine the future of Greece, it very much offers an explanation as to what went so frightfully wrong in its recent past. Um, the choice of venue was also unimaginative, though not without its own symbolisms. By choosing to film the celebratory video clip in the marble-laid Panathenaic Stadium, where Greek modernity reinvented itself as neoclassical heterotopia back in the 1890s, um, the committee made certain it reminded everyone who might care to listen that Greek bodies remain faithful to their archaeolatric selves as years go by. Uh, under the trivialities of the staging, and as the carefully picked, all white, all good looking, able bodied cast mimed the song as if, in fact, they wanted to render some sort of postmodern parody of it. Um, the committee made clear its intentions as to the strategies it is going to deploy in the following months in its attempt to monumentalize Greek public history, Greek collective memory, and in fact, Greek time. Talking about time, I have to show here, even for uh, just one second, this banner designed by the committee where the trajectory of the Greek nation is shown to span from the Battle of Salamis and the internationally famous to the uh, and um, the uh, sorry uh, from the Battle of Salamis and the figure of Pericles in classical antiquity to Kolokotronis and the uh, 1821 revolution Maria Callas and the internationally famous Nigerian Greek basketball player Yanis Antetokounmpo a move that seems to have infuriated more than it pleased here in Greece. Um, I would like at this point to dwell on two examples of the committee's public rhetoric in recent months, um, both referring to actual monuments from recent Greek history, both also related to the current pandemic, uh, though most crucially, both attempting to reframe Greece's dystopic past into something more palatable, a glossier version of itself, as it were, suitable for a less politically inclined market. My first example on the left uh, comes from the official visit last September of the committee's president to Aios Epstratios, the well-known Aistratis islet in the northern Aegean, notorious from its use as a place of banishment for members of the Greek uh, left by the uh, governments of Eleutheus Venizelos, Ioannis Metaxas, and other administrations since 1929 and up to 1962. 
The official press release from the day, however, although it does mention the fact that some of Greece's leading cultural figures from poets Kostas Varnelis and Yanis Ritsos to novelist Menelos Lundemis and actor Manos Katrakis found themselves among the exiles over the years, it fails to mention why and by whom. It does, however, claim that several ships uh, from the island helped with the War of Independence back in the 1820s before concluding that, according to the committee, the local museum devoted to Aistratis um, as a place of exile in recent history stands as a symbol of national reconciliation, again, not quite explaining who is recon reconciling with whom, um, although this new breed of reconciliatory monument was somehow touted as an antidote to COVID-19. Uh, incidentally, um, here is a protest by the permanent inhabitants of the island sometime in the 1950s, asking the state for a doctor to be appointed to the island, uh, a request that was never granted. An equally obscene misrepresentation of recent history had occurred only last July when a similar visit took place on Spinalonga, the infamous leper colony active from 1903 to 1957, legendarily immortalized by 20th century literature, film, and TV. Um, during the visit, uh, one of the local officials claimed that the human values expressed in Spinalonga, whatever these were, uh, thinking, of course, bearing in mind that this was a place of incarceration, exclusion, and suffering. So those human values would be valuable during the current pandemic. What I find interesting in these two examples is how the establishment proceeds to reimagine the two monuments in a cynically meta-political and certainly post-historical context. Conveniently aided by the necessary regulatory controls imposed by the pandemic, the Greek state moves for, forward towards the production of a generalized disciplinary society inspired by this new, frightfully ahistorical past. And a socially distanced one at that, where the dances never stop. And this at the time when other monuments from Greece's recent past are systematically condemned to oblivion. Take, for example, the special decree issued by the head of police, nonetheless, against honoring the Alexis Grigoropoulos monument in central Athens on the 12th anniversary of his murder by two Greek policemen. Ostensibly as a precaution against the spreading of COVID-19, every movement in the area was banned um, uh, for several days. Um, the spot where he was shot was cordoned off, um, even to pilgrims walking there on their own, and police were even seen destroying flowers and other votives some Athenians deposited outside the forbidden zone. Like with the anniversary for the polytechnic rise against the junta a few, uh, a few weeks prior, which was also banned, the state apparatus in effect created two non-monuments, two black hole sites of oblivion, where the nation was invited to forget its recent history in order to consume a new, more fetching past appropriate for the post-pandemic era we keep being promised. Um, it may be argued that biopower wars were always fought on the symbolic register as well. I know it does perhaps sound insensitive to say this after a long Greek decade of austerity, mass unemployment, job precarity, and continuous immigrant and refugee crisis, not to mention the current health crisis. Um, but these images uh, we keep seeing from monuments systematically protected to monuments strategically neglected and back again, this is the protection of the Christmas tree, back in 2008 against riot. Um, so these images are fundamentally biopolitical. And when they refer to antiquity, I would like to call them archaeopolitical. As most of the examples I use today show, however, 
um, these symbolic gestures of inclusion and exclusion affect not just the notional, but also the actual reality we are allowed to inhabit. They inscribe themselves onto our bodies as well as our intellect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri, um, for this um, sort of introduction. What we will do today is to go from uh, perhaps the specific uh, Greek case to um, larger uh, questions. And uh, as Dimitri has just, uh, just said, um, the way that uh, even the monuments are policed um, is um, uh, um, perhaps rightly seen as in a continuum with the ways bodies are uh, um, both policed and um, uh, allowed uh, a certain rights, including uh, the right to, um, to health and other provisions. Um, I'm, I'm saying this because our next speaker, Nel Kaburi, is a specialist, um, a political science who has worked for years um, in documented, discussing, analyzing um, um, the way that Greek citizens and others uh, are allowed or not allowed uh, rights, uh, provisions, and uh, even uh, the very sentiment of belonging. Um, one of the um, best um, 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 best best writers on issues on migration of migration gender uh, social movements um, uh, of her generation in Greece um, we're very proud you're joining us uh, Nelly today she works at the moment in projects between um, the um, uh, between Pandion the University of Social Studies in um, Greece um, and uh, the University of Hertfordshire um, in the UK. So, Nelly. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will uh, speak today about biopolitics and care in the period of the economic crisis and the health crisis. Um, and um, uh, what I'm interested in mostly is uh, the ways in which uh, the notion of care is being um, related to social movements, especially in Greece. Um, so during the early stages of the pandemic, Giorgio Agamben published a short article on what he termed an unmotivated emergency, unleashing a rather unfounded conspiracy theory, which was adjusted to his own analysis of the state of exception. While I share with him my concern for the suspension of democratic rights and the widespread policing that is currently legitimized in the name of the pandemic. In Greece, for example, um, we have several jokes as, as whatever the question is, the answer is the police, whatever the ministry is, the minister is Hrisochoidis, the minister for the protection of citizens. And I'm sure these jokes apply also to other places like Poland, the USA or Hungary. But I find his understandings of biopolitics confusing and misleading. The main weakness of Agamemnon's argument is that it presupposes that the pandemic is fabricated and somehow denies the agency of the virus, but also the vulnerability of our bodies and our fears of being infected or of dying. And I have to admit here that I feel scared I feel that it's not a conspiracy, that the virus is real, even though many governments, including the Greek one, are using it mostly as an excuse to promote autocratic me measures, policing, um, and uh, other forms of control that are typical of dictatorships rather than democracies. So there were several responses to Agamben's article, perhaps too many to discuss here. But one in particular um, is of interest for this discussion. A Greek professor, Panagiotis Sotiris, uh, published an article entitled Against Agamben, Is a Democratic Biopolitics Possible? And in this article, he poses the question, is it possible to have collective practices, and I quote here, that actually 
help the health the health of the population including large scale behavior modifications without a parallel expansion of forms of coercion and surveillance so this is replies a rereading of Foucault's work uh, in um, related to the care of the self or a politics of bios he makes this proposal even more concrete by referring to a biopolitics from below uh, and referring specifically to collective movements around HIV, as well as more, a more, the more recent explosion of uh, social activism in Greece uh, during the financial crisis. In my view, drawing attention to this anti-crisis politics of care is useful, but the argument is, is equally misleading as Agamben's as it silences some of the most contingent aspects of the current pandemic. So I will start by saying a few words about um, this explosion of social movements in Greece during the financial crisis, and I will move on to the current pandemic and try to show what is different, how, how, how things are transformed right now. So following the financial debt crisis in 2008, many states across Europe went through economic restructuring and this included a strong ideological push towards reducing the cost of public health care. So the Greek health care reform is perhaps the most paradigmatic of these uh, reforms in Europe, because this neoliberal boost, which was dictated by the strict program of austerity, but also by memorandums of understanding, prioritized cost reductions over everything else, including um, social inequality. So to, just to, to give a brief idea, 2.5 million people uh, lost their health, their health insurance until 2016 when a new legislation was passed. Uh, these were unemployed people, people who were precarious and couldn't afford to pay contributions. There was a 15% decrease in staff employed in hospitals just from 2009 to 2014. And this led to undersupply of medical personnel, which we experience now, especially with regards to nursing staff. There was a sharp increase in mental health, psychological problems, a rise in HIV infections, mostly linked to drug abuse, and lack of health care provisions and coverage for rising numbers of migrants who were stranded in overcrowded camps at the border, at the Greek borders. So these are the basic characteristics of this reform, of the impact of this reform. So the unemployed, the migrants, the drug addicts became a surplus population, no longer worthy of public health care, and at the same time constructed as a health threat. Um, a health threat for whom? For the general population, of course. The sexist uh, publications of pictures of HIV positive sex workers was a clear mark, mark of this biopolitical shift, manifesting a double policy gesture the Minister of Health, Loverdos, and the Ministry promoted representations of monstrosity of sex worker drug addicts, a group that was marginalized as a direct result of cuts in the funding of healthcare of this particular group by the same ministry. So during the same period of economic crisis and neoliberal restructuring, a bottom-up politics of care emerged in Greece, which is what I think Sotiris refers to because the article is not extensive, so I'm not really sure, but I think this is what he refers to. Rather than a product of careful planning and strategic thinking, this shift was prompted by changes in the biopolitical management of bodies that were identified as unworthy of public health care. So we had on the one hand, the proliferation of social clinics, which were staffed by medical staff who, who uh, gave voluntarily their services um, to people who were pushed out of the system. And secondly, we also have the development of activist practices of care, which became one of the most dynamic aspects of the anti-racist movement in Greece. And the well-known examples are the 300 migrant hunger strike in 2011 and the City Plaza Hotel, which provided everyday uh, support and protection to migrants. And, um, and, and also, I mean, in a more general sense, the solidarity uh, groups that spread all over Greece uh, um, were also a manifestation of this uh, transformation of social activism. 
and I think this is one of the radical and most gendered transformations that took place in Greece since 2008, in the sense that activists in, in such uh, experiments uh, had to relearn and valorize the, neglect, the neglected art of affective and emotional uh, ties. And they had to, revalor, to, to, to recognize the value of social reproduction and that they had to accept that bringing bodies together and moving them beyond an exclusive preoccupation with more confrontational st stereotypical masculine uh, practices of social activism, such as protesting, demonstrating, destroying, demanding, or sabotaging. So this was a very feminist, let's say, bottom-up politics, a very gender bottom-up politics, which essentially transformed the processes of, uh, uh, of care in Greece and, and made a lot of people who would otherwise be indifferent to, um, to reproduction, to, to, be, to make it part of their everyday activism and, and way of life. Now, what happens with the current pandem pandemic, I think, is um, the fact that a huge wall has been created. And there is a numbness, which is mostly associated with the difficult, difficulty. And I, in my mind, I, I don't think it's only the prohibition of getting together with others and sharing because it has become harder and it becomes harder and harder for bodies to come together in solidarity. So this politics of care become more and more difficult. In, the, in that sense, I feel a bit um, that a bit of left wing nostalgia um, is present in the notion of a biopolitics from below. I wish that they were there, but I'm not sure if they are, they are possible right now, given the fact that we cannot get together in solidarity as we could during the financial crisis. So going back to the Foucauldian notion of biopolitics as the management of life, um, as he develops this idea and this society must be defended lecture, we can propose a different reading. So 19th century biopolitical discourse promised an eradication of temporary disasters such as epidemics, let alone pandemics. And this made death imminent. And, and this no longer made death no longer imminent. So hygiene, vaccination, birth control, all of these techniques were intended to push away the danger of imminent death by, by establishing permanent and normalizing mechanisms. And the question of liberalism, which we addressed in relation to the to the financial crisis was a question of more or less government, basically. What do we need in order to have a better uh, management of life, more or less government? But what we're witnessing today with the pandemic is a failure of this biopolitical model as a credible form of government. What we basically witness is that forecast statistics simulations could not, can no longer prevent death from uh, massively infiltrating our everyday life. And this failure is spectacular. It is a failure to predict uh, the spread of the virus and death. It is a failure to contain this, this spread. It is a failure to re regulate life and keep death outside. It is a failure to, to regulate who must live and who must die. And the health crisis thus coincides with the crisis of racism as a way of understanding and managing life. And as Foucault argued, and then um, th that was followed by the idea of necropolitics, racism is a, a precondition for biopolitics as it constructs specific groups as an, on as an ongo ongoing threat to populations. So I think for the present government, it would have been ideal if they could restore the regulating principles that dictated liberal biopolitics. So it would have been ideal if they could restore, restore the threat to public health that they have constructed in previous crises, namely migrants, Roma, the unemployed, the sex workers. If they could be the monstrosities, uh, it could have been much easier to contain this biological threat. In fact, I think the, the Greek government has tried very hard to do so on many occasions through the media and through specifically targeting the Turkish minority in the north of Greece, and also migrants in detention centers, and testing them uh, in an intensified way in order to make sure to, to prove that they are, you know, that the, the threat. But
but the current threat to public health do not necessarily fit into this profile and it was very difficult for them to actually despite these efforts to actually match these people with um uh with a, a virus and um the current pandemic ev evades this kind of uh bi biopolitical mechanisms it constantly sleeps biopolitics and it exposes the limits of biopolitics for example yesterday it was announced that the hyper uh, prospect of immunization through vaccination might, might be pushed to an indefinite future as the new so-called south african mutation may not be covered by the vaccine and i find it completely weird how this fits so well with uh, necropolitics as this mutation that evades uh, vaccination comes from Africa. So perhaps the most ironic impact of this crisis of biopolitics is related to the ways in which it spreads. So in December 2nd, 2020, a paper published by researchers from China and the USA, say in the journal Science, found that the virus is being spread inside the family. And this is the main reason why it persists despite severe lockdowns. And here we find the collapse of another um, important uh, institution of biopolitics, which is the family. Um, and and I, can, I can sense that a lot of people here are saying, but we always said that the family is the source of uh, contamination. But anyway, so uh, although it's self-evident, this research finding is astonishing as it goes against a long tradition of biopolitical ethics that identifies the spread of the viruses with promiscuous sexual encounters outside the family, while the family itself, itself together with the nation, were always the main regulator mechanisms for the containment of biopolitical threats. So if the virus is spread through the family, what is left, what, where can um, biopolitics fit? How can it survive? So I think also the doctor's reaction uh, to this collapse, especially in Greece, to the collapse of biopolitics um, is, um, is widespread. And it's, um, it's challenging the rational scientific foundation of biopolitics. So as their scientific authority fades away in front of the eyes of the astonished public that expects from them a fast and soothing ending filled with vaccines, machinic extensions, and higher hyper real protection devices, doctors, at least in Greece, turn to metaphysics. So the head of the Greek scientific committee for the pandemic prays and sings religious chants while other members of the committee recognize that the most valuable cure will come from Christian faith, and its rituals of drinking the blood, uh, the blood of Christ and eating his body, despite the obvious public health risk that such rituals represent. So in this context, we find ourselves against an impasse, I think, because as soon as we were able to devise a politics of care strong enough to fight against the biopolitics of the economic crisis, we're facing a health crisis, which is also a crisis of biopolitical reasoning and regulation. So what resistances could emerge oh, and, and what subjectivities could emerge within this context, I think is, it's, is not yet clear, but the mere lack of bodily contact in a, is a deterrent towards any kind of politics of care that have been meaningful so far. This for me is the question I would like to contribute to this discussion, uh, a question rather than an answer and uh, I think that we can think further and discuss about it, how, this, how can resistances emerge when the biopolitical forms of government that we were brought up with are collapsing, giving way to a strange and contingent amalgam of superstition, conspiracy, and theology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. Um, thank you very much. I mean, uh, you um, uh, shared uh, ideas about a popular bottom-up biopolitics that have been quite popular in Greece, and then uh, you also deconstructed them and uh, uh, sort of uh, question, uh, 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 left us with this <laughs> very nice question. What will we do without biopolitics? Um, which uh, brings me to the next speaker, uh, Professor Paul Apostolidis, um, who comes to us from L the LSE um, and um, is um, um, 
Thank you, Paul, for accepting our invitation. He's not a Greek specialist, and these uh, debates um, are here to bring in um, Greek, specialists on Greece and specialists uh, um, who come from other fields. Um, um, uh, Professor Apostolidis has been working on questions similar to um, today's uh, topics. Um, and um, let me just mention the title of his last uh, book, um, the fight for time, migrant day laborers and the politics of precarity uh, out by Oxford University Press um, uh, a year and a half ago. Um, um, he, uh, his work uh, focuses uh, um, on um, 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 migration, also labor, um, 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 uh, um, questions uh, of labor, labor rights. Um, and um, uh, he, um, uh, he very kindly accepted uh, to enter into the very uh, Greek-sided uh, debate. Uh, I hope, uh, Paul, um, you know, uh, you, you, you are not completely out of your... Uh, I, I mean, of course, of course, we know that you, you do have a, a, a connection to Greece, but not to Greek studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dimitris. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and especially to you, Dimitris, and to Dimitris Plantos for the invitation to participate. So as Dimitris said, I'm especially honored to be here because I don't have expertise in modern Greek studies, but I have analyzed biopolitics as it affects Latino or Latinx communities of migrant workers in the United States. And I'd like to offer four main points about biopolitics, the salience of which I believe has been heightened by the pandemic. So I'll emphasize the need to examine biopolitics in the realm of hazardous labor and the way that COVID displaces awareness of how deeply embedded these regimes are. I'll also discuss opportunities that I think the pandemic has created for contesting biopolitics by redirecting currents of popular consent that give it the power of hegemony in ways that are inspired by migrant workers organizations, but also implicating the general working population. So given the massive uh, dimensions and the urgency of state efforts to control the spread of the virus through public health initiatives and to launch grand strategies to rescue national economies, it makes sense that analysts of biopolitics would be drawn to study government programs. Foucault's fascination with state power, political economy, medical science, the police, and his formative investigations of biopolitics further guide our gaze toward these institutions. Other critiques of biopolitics inspired more by Agamben and interested in migrants concentrate on the production and disposition of bare life in refugee camps. And of course, this latter approach has uh, relevance for the situation of Greece today with the ongoing issues with Syrian refugee facilities. My proposition though, is that those working in modern Greek studies might find something to learn from the biopolitical management of Latinx migrant workers in the United States from COVID's relation to these processes and from these communities' contestations of biopolitical power. Now, as is well known, the pandemic has intensified racially unequal disease risks and suffering in the world of work. Those classified as essential workers are disproportionately non-white and migrant, and they've been compelled either by government mandate, as in Trump's order that meatpacking workers stay on the job, or by dire economic need to report to their jobs in public transport, hospital care, food production, warehousing, and delivery services. And through their labors, they have kept core social systems operational for all, but they have also shouldered aggravated lethal risk to service those who are sheltering at home. This form of social domination has a history, even though the crisis is now, especially with the downgrading of so many welfare state capacities due to ongoing austerity and privatization, the realm of employment has long enabled racially privileged to thrive by exposing racially subordinate workers to higher risks of disease, disability, and death. Here I'm citing Foucault's thesis on biopolitics and racial domination from his final lecture in the 1976 series. And so my first point is that to see biopolitics in operation during the pandemic, we need to look closely at the conditions and consequences of labor, particularly migrant and non-white labor. Second main point, even as COVID causes biopolitical labor to fluoresce, 
when we see the infection risks faced by essential workers, fixating on virus control measures tends to displace attention from long-standing mechanisms of biopolitics and migrant work. Meatpacking in America is an occupation that is largely staffed by Latinx migrants and African Americans. And for years, it has been that country's most dangerous job. And it illustrates this dynamic of displacement today. So news stories have exposed the perils of viral transmission from having to work at close quarters um, along production lines in beef, poultry, and pork factories. Working elbow to elbow and shoulder to shoulder, reporters decry, mocks social distancing rules, and it's caused infections to spike in rural towns uh, in the West, South, and Midwest. And yet, since long before the risk arose of COVID-19 on a coworker's breath, the close positioning of workstations inside meat factories has posed severe health and safety fat, uh, hazards. One of the most common injuries is getting slashed by a coworker's knife. And these lacerations abound because of the way that workers' tight spacing interacts with core technical factors and management practices in this scientifically engineered production process. Above all, the workers get cut because the line speeds in these automated plants are so inhumanly rapid. So the motions of labor, labor become frantic and chaotic. The speed of the line also has generated a protracted epidemic of crippling muscular and skeletal disorders, especially in the absence of any effective ergonomic standards. For decades, this has normalized working while one is in ill health in meatpacking. So this is not a new phenomenon in the industry, even though the scandal of meatpacking workers who receive no paid time off to recover from COVID has made it seem that way. Also dis displaced from public view is the biopolitical schema that emerges through coordinated actions of the meat industry and the deportation regime. As I argued in my 2010 book, Breaks in the Chain, Latinx migrants are exposed to elevated risks of mortality and morbidity through traumas that are unleashed sequentially on the militarized border and in the food industry. And yet this dimension of biopolitics is further normalized when public commentary observes the racial inequalities in COVID death and infection figures and pinpoints the danger in meatpacking plants, but then fails to contextualize the problems in the cooperation of the racial state and racial capitalism. Nevertheless, and this is my third point, through the power of popular democratic organizing, the current sensitization to occupational health and safety threats due to the pandemic can become a point of departure for more ambitious forms of critique and oppositional action. Biopolitical formations are not only institutional strategies of domination, they're also products of hegemony. These power regimes are built in part through dynamics of popular consent. They gain strength, for instance, through narratives that are prevalent among Mexican migrants that construe their terrifying midnight border crossings and their labor amid the human and animal carnage in the slaughterhouse in terms of blind subjection to power that they can neither understand nor control. And yet as the products of hegemony, systems of labor biopolitics are thereby vulnerable to popular contestation when alternative critical forms of common sense take hold of working people's narrative imaginations. My studies among Latinx migrant workers suggest that this becomes possible through sustained organizing that challenges ordinary workers to exert leadership from below. Particularly important are strategies that treat conflicts over legal rights and individual grievances, like for example, a manager's failure to provide protective equipment as springboards for extra legal direct action and for the expansion of leadership cadres within the rank and file. My more recent research with Latinx day laborers uh, locates the catalyst for counter hegemony in the culture of conviviality fostered by urban worker centers in the US, especially when encouraged with techniques of popular education, those associated with the Brazilian theorist Paulo Freire. Uh, workers mutualist practices in these autonomously governed spaces contest the contradictions of embodied time in everyday work life that biopolitical governance effects. And here I mean the clashes between the oppressive continuity of grave bodily risk and the bewildering discontinuity of ever shifting bodily threats punctuated at random by traumatic injury. Fourth, and finally, 
We should not lose sight of the fact that COVID-19 interferes with biopolitical logics, even as it has furnished new opportunities for intensifying and expanding biopolitical mechanisms. Although the biopolitical management of pandemic responses differentiates the psychophysical fates of racialized populations, the virus also draws all human beings within its circles of risk. Anyone can catch it and anyone can be killed or disabled by it. Not only that, the specific threats of COVID in the workplace point elliptically to predicaments of bodily precarity that afflict working people in virtually all occupations. For instance, respiratory problems due to more work being done indoors and poor airflow systems are an escalating hazard, not just for low wage workers in Amazon's warehouses, but also for legions of office workers. A new consciousness of the health detriments posed by bad air doesn't have to stay transfixed by the individualized threat of a coworker's exhalation. It can move on to demand that employers and governments invest in better air circulation machinery for all. In short, it's possible to find apertures in this moment for building broad forces of solidarity to oppose generalized biopolitical governance. And in such efforts, we can take inspiration from the political innovations of migrant workers, perhaps not only in US Latinx communities, but among migrants in Greece as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for this amazing, amazing <laughs> Um, and uh, so compact, so full uh, lecture, concise lecture in 10 minutes, you uh, managed to say so many things and to be in, uh, in, 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 in an amazing dialogue with Nelly, um, who came before uh, this nice from below, but as well the, the problems, if you see it in a macro level, that this will always uh, have in this kind of uh, um, in this kind of environment. I, I, while you were talking, I saw the workings in the production line. And uh, in a way, I was reminded of the, of the bodies in, in the lines that uh, planned showed us in the beginning uh, in the Panathinaikon Stadion, mm. uh, in a kind of the opposite of the spectrum uh, of bio, uh, biopolitical, um, um, uh, biopolitical uh, uh, lining up, uh, as it were. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to remind everyone that there will be um, uh, there will be time for discussion after all the presentations. But you can still uh, be um, writing your questions. Uh, those of you in the uh, in the Zoom in the Zoom function, those of you watching us from YouTube in the YouTube function, and I will be um, uh, picking up all the questions and uh, will be asking the, um, the panelists um, after after um, the, the first presentations. Um, we are now moving on to our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Dimitra Kutuza, who comes to us from the University of Lincoln. Um, Dimitra, um, who is, is very active in the fields of social research and in questions very, very related uh, to today's topic, pressed us all uh, last year uh, with an amazing, amazing book called Surplus Citizens, Struggle and Nationalism in the Greek Crisis. And um, Dimitra has um, um, uh, framed her discussion of the Greek crisis through what she calls biopolicing. For her, um, um, it was a, a type of biopolicing that became the most effective, but also promoted tool of governance during the Greek crisis. Um, um, it, she was, uh, of course, uh, also, thanks to that, uh, one of uh, uh, the first people we um, um, uh, sort of turned to to invite for today's uh, event. Yeah. And thank you very much, Dimitra, uh, for being here with us. Well, th thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, thank you as well, Dimitris Papanikolaou, Dimitris Planzos, um, um, what are the things, uh, Christina and Maria, um, for inviting me, for organizing this webinar, and for the Rethinking Modern Greek Studies Network, which um, I think is very promising and I'm very excited um, about it. Also, thanks to all the previous contributors for really fascina fascinating and thought provoking presentations. Um, my presentation response um, in a way to Nelly's and Paul's uh, presentations is very relevant to those. 
and also is relevant to the quote mentioned by Dimitris in the beginning of the seminar. Um, in this presentation, I um, reconsider uh, the biopolitics of managing viral transmission as I analyzed it in a paper I wrote back in 2013 entitled Biopolicing the Crisis, Gendered and Racialized Health Threats in Neoliberal Governmentality in Greece and Beyond. That was the title. That paper analyzed the much criticized spring 2012 campaign against HIV testing, public exposure and imprisonment of women who were thought to be sex workers and were charged with grievous bodily harm against their customers. The incident mentioned by Nelly earlier. Uh, and, and this um, strategy also involved the evacuation of overcrowded apartments inhabited by immigrants deemed at risk of infectious diseases who subject them to compulsory testing, treatment and quarantining. Revisiting that, uh, that old article has allowed me to make a number of observations that both in a way correct some of my formulations in retrospect as well as provide some, um, I think, rather moderate insights for understanding our present situation. Well, I think it was easier to criticize the police-led approach towards HIV back in 2012, which was also condemned by the international medical community. The threat of COVID-19 has represented for a much broader section of the global population, leading to so many deaths, has made it harder to take a critical stance towards heavy-handed forms of its management. Um, it is notable that the current new democracy government of Kyriakos Mitsotakis has been praised in international media and gained much popularity for its management of COVID-19 in the first phase of the pandemic, especially when compared to that of the UK, although uh, the summer reopening for tourism retracted some of that praise. As Nelly has also noted, uh, just as in 2012, the pandemic was managed primarily through policing in Greece without much extra investment in healthcare. About 80% of COVID deaths in Greece have taken place without access to ventilators and um, uh, ICUs. And um, keeping in mind that situation of, on the one hand, the policing of healthcare, and on the other hand, lack of access to healthcare. In my old article, I tried to understand the securitized management of HIV transmission in the context of a neoliberal restructuring characterized by shifts from a rights-based management of public, public health to a risk management approach. And um, given the emphasis on migrants and sex workers, um, I also wondered whether that represented also an authoritarian element in neoliberal governmentality generally. Um, however, um, I now believe that the question was not posed correctly because the international dimensions of the COVID pandemic allow us to observe how the securitization of public health takes different forms across the world, which nevertheless have some common denominators and that we, we can now see those more clearly. Greece's approach is similar to that of France and Spain in being more authoritarian and quite different from that of the, UK, of the UK, whose liberalism has led to the highest death rate in the world. The Greek model of securitized public health is almost exclusively police driven and is colored by the social conservatism of the current right wing government in the sense of actively pursuing discursive practices and techniques that victimize, racialized, and gendered, socially marginalized others in the name of protecting the health of regular citizens imagined as belonging to a patriarchal family. These are observations of many commentators and Nelly mentioned that as well. Um, so I could also discuss today how sex workers and prisoners were again marginalized by the health policing uh, again of, of COVID. Um, but for this short presentation, I will just focus on immigrants. Over 2020, while Greek citizens have been under heavy lockdowns and curfews monitored through mobile text message certificates and drones, as well as police in the streets, the movement of migrants was much more heavily restricted. Again, Overcrowded accommodation has been cited as a risk factor that necessitates the detention of migrants recovering from COVID in so-called quarantine hotels, accompanied by opinion articles in news outlets like FEMA, 
about the danger of immigrants posed to the center of Athens. Those migrants in camps like that of Moria in Lesbos were also restricted from going out, even after the country was open to tourism, effectively forced to remain in unsanitary overcrowded facilities without sufficient running water. Um, uh, you may be aware of the fire that destroyed the Moria camp in September, uh, which was started as a direct reaction to this continued pressure. Uh, the attempt to quarantine contacts of migrants within the camp when some of them were found COVID positive caused an explosive situation. And when a number of them escaped and walked towards the local town, the police blockaded the road, treating them as a threat to the citizens. Um, not unpredictable, of course. Um, but in fact, the patient zero within the camp was a recognized refugee who had been in Athens and returned to Moria to escape homelessness. So COVID came into the camp because of refugee poverty outside it. And evidently, while the migrant minority is a victim of majority transmission and lack of basic sanitation, it is perversely constructed as a threat to be dealt with through containment. And now that vaccines are becoming available, if those in crowded camps and housing are excluded from vaccination, they would similarly be seen even more as dangerous sources of the disease reproducing this racializing discourse. So uh, to consider the biopolitics of this kind of situation, in my old article, I am critical of the general concept of population found in Foucault, and I am much more sympathetic to Esposito's observations about what he calls immunization of the national body politic. As I write in the paper, quote, the securitization of health does not take as its object a single population that is the human species as a whole. Instead, it is founded upon a prior separation of human life into multiple populations between national borders, as well as on the basis of pre-existing racialized and gendered social hierarchies within and between nation states. Um, not a, a groundbreaking observation, but worth mentioning repeatedly. Um, However, Esposito as well, I think, fails to recognize the biopolitics of waged labor, the kind of thing that Paul has described uh, so fascinatingly. The securitization of health is not so much motivated by the enhancement of the national population, but it forms part of strategies aimed at decreasing state expenditure, increasing its economic efficiency, and as has been clearly revealed during the current pandemic, finding a so-called balance between, on the one hand, facilitating the biological sustenance and psychological resilience of citizens, and on the other hand, facilitating the production of surplus value through the exploitation of citizens and non-citizens labor. labor. Sorry. Um, so these concerns um, have come into a deep contradiction during the pandemic, and I would agree with uh, Nelly and Paul that they point to a kind of crisis of biopolitics, but I wouldn't see the end of biopolitics in this situation. I think we're looking at something much more sinister. Um, so I will go into the question of how governments make use of medical evidence, which has been at the center of current debates and was also addressed in my old article. Governments apparent disregard of medical experts advice, um, which has been commented upon repeatedly, is far from mysterious if we take into account these contradictory concerns I just mentioned. Uh, which is also reflected um, in the opposed popular reactions for and against lockdowns. In capitalism, wage, labor and economic activity at the same time keeps us alive and socially connected, but wage labor also kills us. And for the most precarious of us, this contradiction has had tragic consequences. Again, Paul's presentation is um, excellent in uh, showing that. But the way science treats epidemiological questions and the economics of lockdowns should also be under scrutiny. And here is where uh, we should think about the new kind of biopolitics that is emerging. 
First of all, um, the epidemiological question of which variant of the virus is this and where did it come from is not an innocent one. When its function is to advise national governments, it concerns migration and constructs migration as an invasion of the disease and infectious biological matter into one that was previously healthy and uninfected, which is always that of the national community. The emergence of new strains and mutations within the national population inevitably challenges this narrative, but again, it is left to others, those in other countries, other governments to protect themselves from the new strain that we created. So the them versus us division is easily reproduced unless epidemiologically, epid epidemiology takes a world perspective that encompasses all humans as well as other species. And here the, the, the question of meat packing and the animal industry and the reproduction of, of the creation of new viruses through that is something to think about. And second, um, the proliferation of calculations or heuristics that aim to find a so-called balance between health and life costs and economic costs, which admittedly can in turn have health costs. Uh, which is what we have been describing as the crisis of biopolitics. The, the, the attempt to resolve this question, to solve this problem, has legitimized the mode of thinking that quantifies and monetizes illness and death in order to calculate the most cost-effective response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the, in the words of the Financial Times economist Tim Harford, the question has been posed as, how do we value a statistical life? Or what are we willing to sacrifice economically to save a life? He mentions that the US Environmental Protection Agency values a statistical life at $10 million in today's money. But judging by the choices made in countries like the United Kingdom, it appears that life was valued at a much lower rate than this. But this returns us to the question of whose life what is as well the value of an aging, non-economically productive life? Does it matter where in the world this life was born, if it is male or female, if it can earn a high income? Um, as vaccines begin to be distributed, it is worth remembering that the national security of the United States was what largely motivated their funding of HIV antiretrovirals for the African poor in the early 2000s. But will we have to resort to those kind of instrumentalist arguments again to justify saving zero valued lives on the basis that this will prevent risk the more highly valued ones? Um, and I believe, um, to finish, that the very discourse of costing lives and the health of populations is the, the one that we should really fight against in the coming months and years, um, the biopolitics of that. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to discussing everything with all of you soon in a short while. Thank you very much, Dimitra. Uh, thank you very much. You, um, you also finished with a question that stays with us, but also gave us this image of humanity as a whole and uh, how difficult is it to think of it, uh, even though it is constantly being um, uh, repeatedly uh, uh, presented as such. Uh, we are presented with humanity as a whole in politicians' discourses, uh, in uh, the whole governmentality we're going through. But then again, humanity is not a whole. And uh, you made that uh, so clear. Um, we're moving to uh, the last presentation. I'm, I'm saying the last presentation because our two colleagues from Durham um, will uh, do something that is interrelated. And you may have, you may have seen it even has um, one title. They have uh, told us they, um, um, uh, they will do something provocative. And these um, are our colleagues uh, from Durham University, um, um, Olga Dimitriou and Elisabeth Kirchoglu, who have been with us from the very, very uh, first 
aspects of this uh, Durham being uh, the third university outside Oxford and Amsterdam, uh, which has been very close to the network and will eventually join the network. Um, Olga Dimitriou and Elisabeth Kitsoglu, I will introduce them together and perhaps you will um, uh, lead one um, to the next in your presentations, are social anthropologists, uh, both of them um, uh, working uh, closely uh, together and having, um, uh, having signed some of the most um, the best known, uh, most discussed papers in their fields related also to Greece in, uh, and Cyprus in, in the case of <clears throat> Olga uh, in the recent years. Um, uh, Olga and Elisabeth, it's for you to close this uh, first uh, part of the discussion before we open up to questions. Uh, for those of you in the YouTube uh, live video and also in the Zoom, please don't forget to um, put up your questions um, while the speakers speak and uh, we will address them uh, after the presentations. Olga. Thank you, Dimitri, and thank you to all the organizers and the, the panelists. I, what we have to say, which um, is more a series of points than a narrative, um, chimes well with a lot of the things that um, people have already said. I want to thank uh, Nelly and uh, Dimitri especially, um, and, and Nelly for, the, for making the point that um, of the failure as a credible form of government rather than a failure of government. And here I have to agree uh, with Dimitri a little bit that uh, there, I also think that there is something more uh, sinister uh, going on. So I will um, do the, the less um, radical thing uh, first and then uh, give it over to um, Elizabeth. Um, what I want to start with is that our work separately, uh, mine and Elizabeth's over the years has addressed notions of crisis and forms of resistance through explanations that once might have seemed profound and now seem facile. And that was my first reaction when uh, Dimitris asked me uh, to present here. So today we have governments, national health advisors and those L subjects that all seem to be working off a biopolitical script. So what is, what is there more to say was my uh, initial reaction. So we thought we would approach this instead by asking is what we have already said still useful. And I think what the, um, what other colleagues have, um, uh, have already presented um, answers this in the positive. So we want to pick out a couple of ideas here that we have each developed in previous work and consider what it might mean for the current situation. Uh, and in my introduction now, I will sketch out some of these ideas uh, in point form rather than a narrative as I try to understand what is happening to power within a global scale of transition of sorts, because I think this is, this is what this is. So as we each thought separately about crisis, emergency, and the exclusions they facilitate, we have been confronting common questions, the location of care in the management of populations, the evaluation of knowledge within systems of such management, the processes resulting from multiple crises as laws and materialities and affects become imbricated. What allows us to pose these questions in the first place is the insertion of emergency into the everyday and its imperceptible morphing into normality. And this is what I think is at stake. So when I read the last line of panopticism, and here I'm going further back into the more classic uh, Foucault discipline in Panish, about, quote, prisons that resemble factories, schools, barracks, hospitals, which all resemble each other, quote, I think of our Zoom cells now, beaming backgrounds of our private spaces because this is how we now work, those of us lucky enough to still do so for our own good and because we care. The problem, of course, with the shift from sovereign to biopolitical governmentality uh, is that it obfuscates the governance of death that it meets out. 
the discourse stripping minorities of rights in Greece and Cyprus that I have been exploring for the last 20 years were always framed as care. And in fact, they were more emphatically so under the more authoritarian regimes. Over the last year, one of the things uniting governmental responses to the pandemic is the experimentation with the latitude granted by emergency legislation. And it is interesting to me that we still, one year on, hear much less discussion of how to police the law than how to police each other's bodies. And I think it is unfortunate, uh, and Nelly referred to this, uh, that Agamben's reactions back in March were scripted, not least by himself, within this medicalized approach. And thus, we get the cordoning off of spaces like refugee camps, where the careful calibrations between health and disease that apply to the rest of us do not pertain and where scrutiny is no longer possible. So NGOs are banned from accessing camps they previously did, refugee settlement is being dismantled, and rescue vessels are prohibited from carrying out their work. And I'm talking here about France and Greece and Italy uh, who are no longer an, alone in doing this. We also get the blatantly contemptuous classification of disease as at once a special and a generic category. As for example, when the Cypriot government used COVID specific legislation to police refugee groups when scabies was detected in a camp. And there is the cordoning off of Roma settlements across Europe and their spraying using planes in Bulgaria. What to me is interesting today is not so much what governments are learning to do, but what they are putting into operation on the basis of what they already knew how to do. As the category of protest appears and disappears from the types of gatherings being allowed under different lockdowns, the measure of proportion to calibrate force used in policing is receding on a global scale. What I do know from Cyprus and its long post-conflict experience in permanent emergency states is that lack of scrutiny over how emergency bleeds into normality, entrenches and naturalizes discriminations that we once questioned. When Cyprus restricted entry to its own citizens in March, we heard that this was not the time to split hairs over fundamental constitutional rights. And I got to see what a travel permit document looks like and the pleading and despair that it represents. Uh, Human Rights Watch and uh, Amnesty International have issued numerous reports in the last year on excessive uses of force on arbitrary detentions, expulsions, forced evictions, which often target already marginalized groups. The moralities developing around conduct, the constitution of households, the privacy of people arrested and fined, more often uh, built on stigmatization than protection. We know more about irresponsible family celebrations than the rise of domestic abuse. And we know much less about the documentation of abuses which is taking place than the policies of repression that are nevertheless effective. What theorists had previously identified as policy laundering in the era of the war on terror, whereby excesses of repressive power were shared between countries and excused on the basis of precedents elsewhere, no longer needs to be excused. They're instead celebrated as good practices, or at least as necessary ones. And so the ordering of knowledge that we're seeing taking place today it's one that deprioritizes rights and freedoms. Along the medics that we see on the various advisory committees, we do not see or hear lawyers overseeing the transition of power that is being effected on a global scale. And while as a population and perhaps so as experts would talk about it, uh, we're expected to train ourselves on basic medical information on COVID the structure, the way its outer shell breaks down, the possibilities of therapy, the differences between the vaccines, uh, its transmissibility indices. I have not heard of a requirement for medical experts sitting on policy boards to receive basic training, as we have required of police officers and judges to do in the past, on human rights, issues of equality, vulnerability, inclusion, gender, and forms of discrimination. 
And I think this is what is in fact at stake at the moment. And it is this transition that is inviting various forms of resistance we are seeing and which come as Elizabeth will now show with their own challenges because in the absence of oversight, anything could now be subject to dispute. Elizabeth. Thank you, Olga. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so yes, following on uh, for on from, from Olga, what I want to talk about uh, is one of the phases that uh, so-called organic bottom-up resistance uh, to biopolitical governance uh, may take. Um, the impetus for uh, what I'm going to tell, uh, to tell you today uh, comes uh, from my previous work and my own engagement with the crisis that starts even, even before 2010, when I was articulating the notion of the crisis of the social contract, uh, a way to talk about a partial democracies as a notion meant to outline the states of exception created by neoliberal political conditions. And what connects uh, that to the present discussion is how several of my Greek research respondents back then expressed their discontent with global asymmetrical relations of power. And they used to articulate this discontent mostly in the form of simplistic political ideologies of the autocratic role of the great powers in global and local political affairs. Those political ideologies incorporated historical events, but also often took the form of conspiracy theories whose narrative plot typically relied on banal nationalism in order to explain why Greece was prevented by the great powers of the world to return to its previous and thoroughly deserved, according to my informant's glorious state. <clears throat> This motif of political commentary continued throughout the years of the financial crisis. History was worked and reworked in the discourses of many of my respondents with elements of banal nationalism in order to complement expressions of dissatisfaction with the Troika's neoliberal regime. This kind of um, uh, criticism often blended with the larger picture uh, of uh, neoliberal technologies of economic subsection with supposedly locally specific motives that say the Germans or the Europeans had to bring Greece on its needs. That part of the critique was usually the context where neo-nationalism entered the picture and, um, and, and widely shared um, uh, arguments about the transference of debt, say, from banks to the people, valid arguments, started merging with conspiracy scenarios about why the Europeans wanted to wipe out a Christian Orthodox country, a patriotic lot who was being punished for resisting multiculturalism and resisting uh, globalization and so forth. A new element started slowly but steadily creeping in this kind of commentary. The prophetic words of holy fathers and reverend figures of Greek Orthodox Christianity, uh, figures like Saint Paisios, Saint Porphyrios, and Cosmas Atolos. Prophecies uh, were always discussed in Greece, I must admit, but they were never prominent in the political commentaries of so many of my respondents. They started gaining ground during the latter years of the crisis when statements of uh, Father Paisios, like you will have a government and you will not have one and many people will plunge to poverty, seem to fit the picture of the country's poverty and subjection to Troika. In the context of the COVID pandemic, however, prophecies seem to be acquiring an increase central role in formulating an idiosyncratic narrative of resistance to the new biopolitical regime. Allow me to read and present to you some extracts from a book that was written in 1999 by the nuns of a monastery affiliated with uh, St. Paisios. The book contains Paisios' sermons and prophecies as these were shared with visitors and his spiritual children. 
And the translation is, of course, mine. So this is something that was written in 1999. And Paisios is presented as saying, things move forward according to the plan. In the US, the microchip dogs emit a signal and this is how they can find them. They will soon do this to people as well. Then an illness will come forward for which the vaccine will become obligatory. This will be the prelude to accepting the seal of the Antichrist. Whoever does not accept it will not be able to sell or buy or take on a loan, become employed, etc. The Antichrist will impose himself on the world through a worldwide economic dictatorship, through an economic system that will control the global economy, and only the sealed ones will be able to engage in trade. The seal will not be just superficial. Haragma, haraso, Paisius keeps saying, actually means carving. Everything will be controlled through powerful computers. People's bodies will be confessing on the click of a button. See what kind of dictatorship the Antichrist has designed? Some Europeans resist it for reasons of democracy, because they do not want this dictatorship. But we, the Orthodox, we resist this because we don't want the Antichrist. And of course, we also don't want the dictatorship. This dictatorship will be imposed insidiously. Cash will disappear. They will force people to trade only in plastic money. Gradually, all our information will be stored in computers. The global dictatorship will be able to follow every move we make and everything we say. They will never openly force anyone to be sealed, but they will make the lives of people who are, not, who are not sealed miserable. It will be almost impossible to survive, and this is how many people will be forced to accept, to accept this new regime of Antichrist's global dictatorship. Prophecies like this one above have started receiving what seems to me an unprecedented recognition in Greece amongst, of course, certain circles that nevertheless are incre increasingly going well beyond the category of the cult of a religious groups that used to entertain such things in the past. Their eschatological character and the relative precision with which they sketch the future, which is fast becoming the present, are predictably major attraction points. In my fieldwork experience, prophecies gain ground every day as the organizing seed of a certain narrative of resistance to the biopolitical regime that intensifies in the context of the, of the pandemic. They provide discursive tools to everyday actors who wish to dispute the notion of the securitized body and to formulate a more generalized critique towards neoliberal citizenship and its technologies of population management. Prophecies become key discursive tools in a new popular and populist critique of the pandemic, the new world order, global governance, <clears throat> and, and a global dictatorship that promises a reduction of health risk in return for our profound subjection. As I was arguing back in 2010, conspiracist political scenarios should not be regarded as indicative of some flawed primitive logic, but as forms of political etiologies that, act, that attempt to explain the world and to resist neoliberal asymmetrical power structures, neocolonial extractive relations between nations, and the erosion of democracy and the social contract. It is also true, however, that conspiracist discourses uh, more often than not, become a fertile breeding ground, ground for neo-nationalist ideas and for ultra-right-wing political radicalization. I do not mean to resort to crude generalizations here, but while I'm continuing my long-term ethnographic engagement with Greek actors, I have uncanny déjà vus. The easiness with which civic rights were compromised in the context of care, as Olga said, the increasing power of technocrats, back then during the financial crisis, the economists and now health professionals, and the pattern of marginalizing opposing voice, voices as unprogressive create, I argue, the conditions of yet another revival of the new rights in Greece. 
amongst the skeptics of our biopolitical moment, I can distinguish the equivalent of what used to be the lower and the upper Syntagma Square crowds. Namely, I hear the critique to the neoliberal agenda of the current biopolitical regime that is coming from the left, but I also listen to another crowd, much less sophisticated and much more prone to neo-nationalism, to conservatism and to alt-right radicalization. Prophecies provide narrative cohesion to those discourses that resist vaccination, question COVID measures, support the right of Christians to receive Holy Communion, but also highlight the allegedly preferential treatment of certain groups like migrants, the Muslim minority or the Roma. Most importantly though, prophecies are being used to legitimize the loss of trust to democracy and democratic governments. Discontent with the erosion, erosion of civic rights overflows and spreads to question the purpose and the very existence of institutions as anything more than facades of an impending global dictatorship. This is of course a form of resistance to biopolitical power, undeniably, but one that does not bring us closer to any positive visions of citizenship. The new biopolitical moment becomes steadily saturated with novel transformations of the ultra-conservative, alt-right social agenda. And like I always did, I propose that we take such uh, transformations very seriously and that we invest time and research expertise and attention to them uh, because, um, as they say in the UK, fool me once, uh, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, or as we say in Greece, to this examartinu kandrosofu. And I think we've seen uh, too many of those transformations in the past, and, and we've seen their results. Um, and um, I think that we shouldn't let this one um, be understudied uh, this time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for um, keeping time. We had, uh, uh, as uh, has happened before, we have had um, quite a number of speakers and uh, to keep with the webinar tradition, we have asked them to um, make short papers addressing past work of theirs uh, in uh, the context of the current moment. And thank you all for doing doing. Uh, we started from a paper that talked about uh, um, sort of the way the classical past and the way the monuments are used in Greece as it also forms of biopolicing and of producing the healthy body as image and as also a form of control. Um, and we've ended with this uh, uh, magnificent uh, um, take on uh, prophecies, on narratives, on the way they create a type of resistance from below, but perhaps the type of resistance that we are not necessarily uh, going to applaud as a um, resistance to enforcement and to um, 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 control. Um, all the speakers talked about biopolitics from above and another type of biopolitics, politics of life from below. And I wanted, as um, we're expecting your questions, there are some that have already come in, but as we're expecting more questions from you, I wanted to address this to all uh, speakers to our panelists, um, this idea of uh, do we have two types of biopolitics? Is there a type biopolitics from above and a biopolitics from below? Uh, is it easy to distinguish between the two? Um, this is a, a kind of first thought. Uh, also, inviting you all uh, to participate now and perhaps also address questions uh, um, um, that uh, um, sort of bridge the papers between you. I don't know who wants to go first. This is always a difficult moment, isn't it? 
Shall I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Dimitris, and perhaps I wanted to address Paul, address that question to Paul as well. Uh, yeah, Dimitri, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to be a very, very short. I think, uh, th yeah, the, an the answer is yes. Uh, we, we do have two sorts of biopolitics, and we always did. It's just that Foucault was so absorbed with uh, state power um, that missed it or wasn't interested in it, or what, I don't know. But um, I think now that the, 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 this discussion about biopolitics has, has come uh, full circle, um, and now we all know that we all know about biopolitics. Um, uh, I think it's easier to, 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 to uh, locate it um, elsewhere. And uh, um, for example, in your discussion about, uh, about Golden Dawn, you could, you could see how um, a sort of a popular movement, uh, not very popular with us, but certainly popular pop movement, was exercising its own biopolitics to its own um, people. Um, archaeophilia is a sort of biopolitical um, uh, gesture but, uh, or uh, force actually from, from, from below. Uh, most people I know liked the Panathinaic Stadium show. Most of my students did. Most of my students say, yeah, you know, why not? We, we, yeah, it's so nice, you know. Uh, how else? So, um, and, uh, and um, if you, if you, <laughs> if you and I, Dimitris, were part of this committee, we're probably organized to dance in the stadium as well. So I, th I think, yes, the, answer, the, answer, the short answer is yes. Can I come in as well? I, th I think, yeah, I will, I will agree that it was there and I will agree that, I mean, for me, this is the whole um, idea behind the, the point that power works because it's being internalized, right? And the whole discussion of counterconduct that then goes from the classic works to the, to the lectures and the discussion of, uh, of biopolitics uh, as a specific sort of question and, and named as, as a question uh, is, is exactly that. So, so it is um, the, the counterconduct um, uh, theorization that, that uh, sort of brings together this, to me, uh, the, the top-down, bottom-up um, uh, approaches, which I don't think um, Foucault has ever theorized as, as separate um, sort of domains. So that, that would be my reading on that. I think Elizabeth wants to come in as well. Part of my, part of the, of the presentation that uh, I had to cut uh, to fit, uh, to fit the time, uh, was talking about another kind of uh, very eerie structural similarities with the present, uh, uh, between the present rift of the coronavirus deniers and the COVID uh, measure supporters and the, the Euro remainders and the, and the, and the OHI. Uh, I mean, first of all, aside from the fact that most of the, most of the times they are the same persons, so those respondents that I had uh, who were very sort of Euro remainder enthusiasts, they are now fervent uh, fervent uh, COVID measure supporters. Uh, also, there is a there is an, a, an ex a, a, there is an extremely obvious structural similarity between the way they deal with both things. They deal with both things as being the crowd uh, who believes in modernity, who drives Greece forward, the crowd of progress. I see Dimitri Serplanzo, uh, uh, you know, nodding uh, positively, uh, which gives some also some extra validity to my ethnographic findings. Uh, uh, they, they are the, the, the keepers, you know, they, they are the, the guards in the panopticon and, and, it's, um, and it's very obvious, it's very obvious. And all that discourse of modernity and progress and Europeanization and modernization that goes with it uh, is very similar on both occasions. Um, Paul, uh, we've got questions that are coming in from uh, the YouTube uh, live video as well. So. Um, Paul, is there a, um, uh, still the same question? Is there a top and top, top uh, bottom and bottom up uh, perspective in biopolitics? Yeah, no, I, I agree that there is. And I think, so to me, I really think the notion of care that Nelly emphasized is crucial for theorizing the bottom up kind of uh, biopolitics or politics of life. Um, for me, in, in my own research, I've seen, I, I associate this with practices that the workers themselves call 
relations of conviviality um, in the worker centers that day laborers have organized in many U.S. cities. And um, in, in the book, what I talk about is the way that that beginning on a very interpersonal level of care for one another in everyday situations of suffering. So suffering was a big theme in the interviews with these, with these workers. And it was sharing things, sharing material objects like food or bus tickets, but also sharing time with one another. And these forms of interpersonal care then developed in the organizational context uh, into uh, autonomous governance of the, of the organization and democracy and democratic politics and then assertive politics in the community at large. Um, not for every member by any stretch, but as a tendency within the worker center. That's where I find the lacuna in Foucault is not really theorizing the political dimension. You know, there's the kind of the, the techniques and care of the self, um, and then there's biopolitics in the institutions. But um, uh, my colleague Ellen Myers has actually articulated this really well in her critique of Foucault. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to say is uh, I think ecology also has a role to play when we're thinking about the politics of life from below. And this idea is suggested but not developed by the Latin American philosopher Enrique Dussel, um, who um, I'm getting interested in and I'm not really seeing an elaboration of the idea, but I think that increasingly with the problems of climate change it's worth thinking about the ecological context of a politics of life. Um, and which tends to assert itself in the work of migrant workers as a sort of uh, uh, lethal and despoiled environment in the ecological sense that many of them encounter in their work. You see, Paul, I, I see that you, are, you all converge in this idea of um, um, the politics of life that come from above, politics of life that come from below, mostly in the form of care. I remember, remind everyone in a recent book, Care, a manifesto, uh, colleagues who have talked very much about this. I then, though, um, remember this image you shared with us, Paul, of the cut, the work is cut. And when this happens, so much converges. Of course, there will be care mm -hmm. from others. Or but not necessarily. That is, that is kind of intersects um, the, the failure to the workers, the possible failure of the health system or coverage, the um, continuing then um, 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 question of workers' rights and whether this person will get um, the support, uh, whether then there will be a union to support that. So this idea even, and, and in these intersections, both the bottom down perspective on a biopolitical care management and the bottom up um, perspective on, on, on kind of care uh, to each other will be both reaffirmed and tested, you see. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where the one starts and the other. I remember the cut and I don't know uh, where, where one, come, one starts and the other um, finishes. And I remember here what Nelly also told us. Um, I need to share with you a couple of questions that are coming in um, and also uh, share, um, again, I, I mean, you're free to jump in the questions and uh, um, uh, sort of make comments in, in, in all of them. So um, Yanis Mameledzis, um, 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 uh, a former colleague at Oxford uh, um, uh, and a, um, a researcher in public health asks the following. He says, um, they, um, as his capacity as an epidemiologist, he makes the following point. He says, we need greater transparency on policy development data transparency as a baseline. Then everything else, he says, can flow. I remain concerned for a potential third wave and uh, um, um, look what happens, um, uh, what happened in Ireland recently, also Portugal. And he reminds us this need for transparency, for data, which I, I think um, reflects also uh, or, or, or comes together with what um, Olga uh, has told us. Um, he also um, 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 reminds us of uh, um, um, uh, that politicizing vaccination is inevitable, he says. 
um, um, it's not wise, but it will be inevitable which populations will get. Take it from an epidemiologist um, uh, point of view, uh, you know, which populations will get uh, the, 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 uh, the vaccine first is a political decision that has to happen if I read your question, uh, Ioannis, um, correctly. Uh, there will be vaccine nationalism. And what will we do with that is the question. We have others, but let's address this first and then um, uh, I'm getting back with more. So be brief. There were both questions, comments. And so I don't know if you, you Nelly, or... Yeah. Yeah. Shall, I, oh. shall I provide the response unless Paul wants to... Yeah, Dimitra Nelly, who haven't spoken, but also you, yeah, Elizabeth, yes. Yeah. Um, the transparency argument, I mean, I see the argument, it's a very technocratic argument, uh, but nevertheless, we have to think about it um, in, in, in relation to the illusion of the risk-free body. You know, I think that the risk-free body a securitized body, to securitize the body in order to supposedly make it risk-free is an, is, is an illusion. Uh, greater transparency is, 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 is not going to help us either deal with a biopolitical issue or deal with all forms of resistance. Uh, Luben, let's call what I presented, Luben form of resistance, uh, or uh, more sophisticated forms of more forms of resistance to to, to biopolitical governance. Uh, the politicization of the vaccination will be unavoidable, uh, but one of the things that we need to be looking at is the monetarization uh, of the vaccine. Which bodies will be will be vaccinated? Okay, uh, when, where, and why, and what are the things that are going to be allowed? to those vaccinated bodies and the, and, the, and the things that will be not allowed to the unvaccinated bodies. So here we are talking about <clears throat> uh, new forms of biocitizenship, uh, which, will be, which will be tremendously problematic. Uh, if somebody doesn't want to be vaccinated for whatever reason, okay, Luben or non-Luben, okay, uh, they, they will not be allowed, for example, to travel. Uh, they will not be allowed to exercise the, the, rights, uh, the, the rights they have uh, of free movement within the EU. We already know that Germany uh, is discussing not allowing unvaccinated people to pass its border. We're going to have new forms of border and so on and so forth. So it is a huge you know, um, I think it's an illusion to say new forms of border. There were always forms like of border. intensification, it's further it's intensification. Yeah, 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 yeah. Further yeah. intensification. Yeah. It's just that we now see them in their proliferation. I, agree. I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I take it back. I totally agree with you. The intensification, the biopoliticization. I totally agree with you. Oh, so but for others, it was like very. For different. others, it was always like that. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, if I um, uh, read you correctly, your answer to Yanis is, uh, you know, not only who will take the vaccine is political, uh, politics only starts now, you know, <laughs> wait and see how much politics there is now um, and has always been. I don't know, Nelly, you wanted to? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um... I think that uh, right now um, we are facing um, a challenge with, uh, um, let's say, the politics of care, precisely because uh, um, we are uh, in a situation where um, uh, bodies cannot get together easily without uh, risking infection. And this is not just, as I, as I said in my presentation, I think this is not just a question of uh, um, prohibition. It's also a question not only of, of, of uh, internalizing the, the fear of being infected, but also of actually uh, being in a situation where uh, you are risking your life if you are being together with others. We saw these images that Paul presented uh, in um, uh, images of work where being with others 
is a dangerous situation basically. And this creates also huge difficulties for the politics of care that I referred to. Um, communal uh, practices that, that were previously, um, let's say, uh, resisting the um, biopolitical logic of, um, of uh, statistics and, uh, and uh, population management are, are now difficult to, to, to actually perform and I think these bodily aspects of the current pandemic is something that also challenges uh, what uh, the possibilities of resistance. And that's, uh, that's why I think that a lot of the examples that we used, that all of us used, were uh, of uh, resistances, they were actually either from uh, people who were deniers of, uh, of um, the, the virus or or an anti-vaccination, anti etc., or they were from the past, from the pre-COVID period. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a fundamental, that's why I, I try to speak about a crisis of biopolitics in the sense that um, there, are, there are different levels of this crisis, but it is a crisis also for us. And what I, I can detect also from my perspective is that I see no other option but to adopt the um, uh, bio, biopolitical authority let's say to, to, to think of vaccinations as an important uh, as, a, as the only solution because there seems to be nothing else given the fact that we cannot get together that our bodies cannot get together mm -hmm. so um, and, and 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 this is very problematic in my mind and I will give you a very precise uh, example and this is that the fact that there are genealogies of uh, vaccination that are very colonial, post-colonial. We have in the US, we have an official pardon by Obama uh, on uh, the politics of vaccination. And we have basically the same mechanism, the same companies, the same, the same uh, pr uh, practices being the only the only let's say the only horizon that you can we can think of as alternatives to the current situation i i have uh, and and this for me is an impasse it's a very problematic situation where um at the same time as the biopolitical uh, authority is being undermined uh, by the fact that it cannot work at the same time we seem to have no other horizon than biopolitics and uh, to, to give enough to to to, re, re, to, have, to respond also to the question of transparency I mean I, I'm really curious to see what the, the the discussion is in the Greek committee given the fact that there's so much uh, uh, metaphysics in what they are doing I mean it's obvious they have been open about that I mean I, I'm afraid that if we if it becomes more transparent, we will lose all faith in anything <laughs> medical. Nelly is referring to, to the Committee for the Management of the Coronavirus Crisis. In... Okay. But, but I mean, if they start talking about, uh, you know, uh, all these metaphysical things, I mean, it is, you know, in a sense, it is a challenge, this transparency, although I understand the political rationale behind it. I mean, I'm afraid what it is that we're going to hear that, that they are talking about. I suppose well, they also mean transparency of the data, the, I mean, the, the sheer data yeah. of how many casualties, how many infected, and so not just the, uh, the minutes of the meetings, yeah, which yeah. would be hopeless. Yeah. We had a perspective. Just, just a, a, can I add something about the data? I think one of the problems in Greece specifically is that the data is unreliable. There are many, um, many signs of that, that it is unreliable, but the question for us, I think, is what is unreliable in a biopolitical context? What exactly constitutes the unreliable in a biopolitical context? Exactly. And to what extent we will, we will uh, endorse the medicalization of this crisis? Or, or as Olga said, to, to what extent we internalize it even in our uh, attempts to fight it? Um, Mark Fisher said that um, in talking about capitalist realism, that the, its main feature is that you cannot think of any other alternative. You cannot think of another world outside. We are maybe now entering a biopolitical 
realism, in which being realist is to, to completely adopt the whole biopolitical state uh, and, and not able to think of any other. So the, 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 the call for more data is at the same time a radical call in order to be able to um, call people uh, responsible if need be, but at the same time works well with this idea of constant biopolitical realism. I don't know if Dimitri you want to address briefly what has been said. Uh, yeah, um, I only have um, 30 minutes before I also need to, uh, to leave. And also there's like only four minutes to the end of the meeting. We will, uh, so, yeah. It, yeah um, so, yeah. so yeah, I mean, you know, um, because the, the, there is the call for data and there is a call for accurate data and people who want to resist the situation, uh, who want to talk about the value of life have been very, very closely monitoring uh, statistics of uh, COVID cases, statistics of death. Uh, um, I, I, I am aware of people within my social circle who might be listening, who have been doing that very intensively. And and, and, and I would say that this sort of pulls us, like you said, pulls us in to this sort of calculative uh, mentality, which is um, at the root of what I think is the neoliberal governmentality and its biopolitics, which is this sort of uh, calculation of the costs of, of health, the costs of mental health and the, the, the attempt to monetize everything and the attempt to sort of monetize everything so that you can have one unit of calculation for labor, health, all kinds of forms of human activity. Um, and and, and this, this is sort of becoming a necessity from the perspective of the state at the moment and the extent to which we can sort of try to think in a different way is, is a question that we have to face right now. Oh, yep. Um, Can I add a short comment? Very short, because before I read out last questions and then you will all have the, um, the opportunity to address, to make a brief com closing comment um, addressing those questions. Uh, but yes, Olga. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to this question of, of knowledge and how, how the, the politicization of knowledge is, is actually happening is, is to me uh, quite interesting because we are uh, discussing um, data and how to scrutinize data. But, but the, my question is why should we scrutinize uh, data instead of scrutinizing things that we actually know how to scrutinize. And, and I think that what Nelly said about continuities is, is really important because if we think about the vaccine as uh, a sort of, you know, in its relation to citizenship, being as an image, um, being a requirement to cross borders, as Elizabeth said, right? So it becomes an appendix to the passport but appendices to passports have actually always been there for some populations. And they have always, and vaccine appendices to passports have always been there for everybody for some countries, right? So I think it's, it's, it's kind of back to these global hierarchies that we have to uh, be rethinking in relation to sort of um, putting down the line between what is happening now that is completely different and, and things that have been going on that have been separating us, us from them. One of the questions that has just um, come in um, relates exactly to that. So I will try to summarize there is a number of questions that have come um, to me and um, I'll try to summarize them and then I will give you the organizers uh, um, have um, been kind enough to give us five more minutes. Uh, so let's hope that in five minutes we can um, sort of address everything that needs to be addressed and then uh, close. Um, so um, I will um, summarize other questions that have come in and we'll ask you all to address uh, whoever wants to as a final comment. Uh, there, is, there are a couple of comments about what um, we mean by counter-resistance. 
those of you who spoke, those of us who spoke about the counter resistance. Um, could we give an example? I think examples have been given, um, but Effie uh, Vutira in the in the question um, space uh, is asking for that too. Um, also, um, we have talked about prophecies, narratives that people construct, uh, and um, um, it, it, are prophecies an either or commitment, or can people uh, believe in prophecies or believe in conspiracy theories, but then do something else too? Believe in conspiracy theories, but also um, uh, believe in the data and also go get vaccinated. We recently had the example of one of the heads of the Greek uh, church uh, who did um, at various points defy um, um, orders, uh, uh, but at the same time went and got vaccinated. Um, and then there is also a number of comments about uh, this issue of how we perform in public space, how we belong in the collective, how we relate uh, to others, how even we relate to social groups. Will these be affected in uh, the contemporary moment? Does the contemporary moment in the way it affects those belongings, those public belongings or non-belongings anymore has to tell us anything about the past as well? Was there in the past also various things that we hadn't seen? Um, and I think Paul uh, spoke to that um, quite well. And last but not least, a question about uh, the family, uh, which of course goes beyond um, uh, Greece. Um, it is true that this idea of the family as a central, um, um, uh, a, 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 a core uh, that could uh, sort of make people safe from the vaccine um, can, 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 can fuel xenophobic uh, uh, discourses um, and all that. Um, but um, it, 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 it is also true recently, and this is, if I understand it well, uh, the uh, point of the question, uh, that now that the family is picked up as a locus of contagion, could this be once more, and in an unexpected way, a fuel for xenophobia, given that um, often we have minorities very much um, organizing their life around family and kin uh, network. Uh, so if beforehand uh, the newcomers were like a threat uh, to the national family, uh, would it be now the opposite? Uh, now that we that the family becomes a locus of uh, transmission more and more, could it be a new xenophobia saying that uh, uh, would suddenly the family uh, sort of become um, a different way of repositioning um, the same racist discourses? Uh, difficult questions, complex questions. These and everything else you want to address. Uh, could be addressed in your closing statements. Uh, I hope I summarized the questions properly and I'm sorry if I didn't. So do you want to start to in the way in the, um, um, uh, in, uh, as we spoke um, 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 with Dimitris Plantos first? Okay, uh, well, I, I really don't know uh, how to answer these questions. I think it's still very, very open-ended. Um, it, it is. It is. It is a, a, a biopolitical moment we're living. We're experiencing. Um, depending on the on the development of the of the pandemic itself, which is still uh, uh, flowing, um, uh, we need uh, we need to monitor the ways the state and us and the, the, the body politic and families um, react to to this. Um, I can see the uh, the biopolitical pressure picking up, but I can also see. By political exercises like the quarantines, the vaccinations, the um, the SMS we need to send to to get out of the house. All these are by political exercises in place. Um, it is a bit of, a, of an experiment we're we're participating in, and uh, uh, we need to see uh, where it gets us. Paul. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I I just want to say uh, very quickly. I think. What occurs to me when I think there were some some real indictments of nationalism in the ways that that biopolitics in the COVID era redoubles the authority of nation states and and distracts people from criticism of nations. So I think that Dimitri's point about how a world perspective 
is necessary to, to uh, resist those tendencies, um, I think that's something that, that comes through very strongly in this, in this discussion. And the second thought I have just been having is I wonder what the relations are or how they can be mapped between the kinds of public spectacle that Dimitris Pontos was talking about initially and biopolitics in these other spheres, um, the micro spheres of labor processes and of um, vaccine uh, clinics and, 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 uh, and, and domains like that. I think that's, that would be really productive to think about. Nelly? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, first of all, with regards to the question of resistance, I, I use this word quite a lot uh, uh, because I think that the, the Foucauldian analysis uh, uh, has many, um, uh, is it, very unclear about um, how to escape power. And this is an ongoing discussion, of course which uh, we cannot resolve here. But uh, the main issue here is that um, biopower is precisely um, a relationship that is uh, productive. So it produces something. It's not just a, a form of domination. And the problem with this is that we, as um, let's say, there is no possibility of actually be of an outside in this context. And that's why we are talking about resistance in the sense of being able to explore a, a different way of approaching things. And, and uh, for me, uh, right now, the, the main question, which is, uh, which I, I'm puzzled with, it's not, it's not really that I have an, a, an answer to that question, is that is the fact is related to the fact that I can see that the um, that the authority of biopolitical knowledge production is being undermined increasingly by by the failures of um, of the of the system of uh, um, of control of the pandemic. It seems like the pandemic is not. It's not being controlled at the moment, and you, 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 we can see a relapse to to forms of um, uh, of uh, power that are sort of in Foucauldian terms they are they are pre uh, um, pre um, bi bi biopolitical, not in the sense that they don't exist anymore, but this type of policing is not necessary if biopolitics is not failing, basically. This time of type of extreme policy is not necessary, and uh, for me this is an important question, which uh, perhaps would uh, would would make it more fruitful to talk about uh, to to think about new uh, forms of power. Uh, what what you know? I mean, a lot of people have talked about that, but I think that this is where uh, this takes us eventually. Dimitra. I'm afraid um, I will have to make a very slightly personal comment, given that I have to go back to family childcare right now and the, and the care situation that has been created by COVID, uh, particularly the contradictions around the fact that um, in many places, uh, nurseries stay open in order to keep parents at work. On the other hand, that puts um, teachers at risk, uh, which bring the viruses to their homes. Um, if you close the nurseries, that everybody stays in one household being an explosively unhappy family, I don't know how that kind of um, relates to the question of the family, of care, of immigration. Um, I'm just sort of like had myself to live in the contradictions of that in the past year. And, um, and I think that it is, it is part of the whole kind of way in which the situation becomes um, 
difficult to disentangle. We all live in its contradictions and to find points of resistance, then we take a step in that way and then we find that that's not right. And then we take a step in the other way and we find a wall there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear, but yeah. that's because I have another work <laughs> that's waiting for me right now. I'm sorry. You know, basically, we are all in it, very weirdly all in it. And um, we're trying to disentangle, entangling more. But uh, Olga. Yeah, on counterconduct, I, um, I had a paper a, a few years ago where I also argued like other people that um, actually that, that's one thing I feel that Foucault didn't um, uh, didn't explain very well, but um, uh, but I sort of tried to um, to see um, where in this huge spectrum of of resistance that he described we could uh, possibly find something uh, to work with. And and one of the things that I was looking at was Radenzier's, um concept of the senses, which is sort of moving on uh, into the uh, the question of democratic processes uh, much more than uh, than Foucault did. Um, and I, I think to me, what I try to, um, uh, to conceptualize through this moment is, is the idea of transitional phases um, on the basis of the ways in which we think about post-conflict um, uh, situations um, elsewhere. Um, and uh, in, in a lot of the literature, those transitional phases are often um, thought about as opportunities for greater rights, for greater uh, liberties, for opening up new, uh, 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 new possibilities for uh, democracy to flourish and so on and so forth. But I think what we're reminded here is that transitional phases are also opportunities for authoritarianism. And, and I think, I think we, we need to continue thinking along the lines that, uh, that Nelly was saying. Um, why is it that we are seeing this um, increasing um, emphasis on, on repression? And, and what is that doing in relation to, uh, to resistances? And I think that that's where the sort of, um, uh, counterconducts um, uh, become possible that we would um, we would like not to be seeing, which is what uh, what Elizabeth was describing. And Elizabeth, uh, I think following on from Olga, but uh, also a very very brief comment. I think one sentence: uh, what you said. Uh, we are living through this tra transitional moment. This is undeniable. Uh, what, uh, what I see is that it's bringing the erosion of trust to all kinds of institutions. Okay, family, democracy, democratic rights, rights, the legal um, sector, legal institutions, all of that. The, the, the erosion to institutions from one point of view may seem very revolutionary in the sense that a lot of those institutions have been seen as uh, lo lo loci uh, of conservative values, okay? But at the same time, I will always be here to remind you that the erosion of institutions is not a, a thoroughly good thing. Okay, that there is that there are the resistance and counter resistance in the medical sense has very many faces. Well, um, thank you for that. This was a panel that uh, somehow undermined some uh, some some um, uh, kind of the facile. Uh, narratives of uh, this period, including the narrative that we now believe in institutions. Uh, we addressed 
uh, the, um, um, uh, the center of power as the perennial doctor uh, that we have also been seeing uh, recently in all its um, um, different uh, um, openings, uh, gaps, uh, fissures and uh, problems. Um, we tried to start from our local perspective and also um, engage in as many um, uh, possible um, um, uh, links and um, connections. So I wanted to thank all the panelists, Dimitris Plantos, Nelly Kamburi, Paul Apostolidis, Dimitra Kotuza, Olga Dimitriou and Elizabeth Kirchoglu. This was one of many webinars. We organize a webinar every month and you can find a special YouTube channel um, with all our um, past uh, webinars and also announcements for the future webinars. I want to say a huge thanks to the Dimitris Planters who helped us uh, with um, convening, um, organizing uh, this particular panel. And of course, of course, to my colleagues in the network, Maria Boletti and Christina Gietgaudaiti. Uh, who this time have not been very visible, but have been running the show um, um, pretty much as much as I uh, did. This uh, was a webinar organized by um, uh, the um, um, uh, Network Rethinking Modern Greek Studies. This is a cultural analysis network supported by the Oxford Research Center for the Humanities, but also by our individual funders, by the Faculty of Modern Greek Studies at Oxford, by the Marielena Laskais Chair at um, um, Amsterdam and the Marilena Laskaridis and the Laskaridis Foundation. Um, it is also a network that we want to expand and we will be having a new web very soon. Please stay tuned. As we say, please stay safe, but also please keep questioning what safety means. Thank you very much all for joining. Thank you. Thank you.